for this meeting of the December board meeting um, to order, showing all members present except Jeff Martin and Joel Sanders. And we will start with invocation by Mr. Red Holmes. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day, Lord. We thank you for life. We thank you for this school district. Lord, you know this messed up old world, this time we're going through. And I just ask you to place your hand on every student, faculty member, parents in this district, all over the state of Texas, this world, and mainly here at North Carolina, Lord. Just give them a hedge of protection that only you can, and the ones that are sick, give them the comfort that you can. Lord, watch over them. Kids are riding the buses back and forth. Parents are bringing them to school every day, giving them safe travel. And we just ask you to be with all our, our kids that are traveling from sports to state band competition and set a tone, Lord. Just give them safe travel to them. Just, have, just be with us during this meeting, Lord, that everything we do will be pleasing to you. These things we ask in Christ Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We'll have the pledge led by Parker students tonight. Okay, we'll move on to public testimony. Ms. Doyle, no one signed up for public testimony? Okay, so we'll move to item four, recognition of local businesses. Uh, Ms. Hughes and Ms. Compton. <coughs> Thank you. 
Okay, so we'll move on to number um, item number five, consent agenda, uh, approval of previous meeting minutes. Has everybody had a chance to look at that? Okay. Do we have a motion to approve? Okay, motion by Red, seconded by Bo. <coughs> Any discussion? Okay. All in favor? Right hand. Opposed? Okay, motion carries. Five to nothing. And then B, monthly financial report. Ms. Darrow? Okay, yes, I was asked to pull the investment report out of the consent agenda so that way y'all can ask any questions if you had any and also show a comparison from where we were this time last year to where we are this year. So does anybody have any questions on that? And then attendance and enrollment, Mr. Watson. The uh, attendance sheet should be in your board folder. If you look at our actual enrollment at Higgins, we're now 306. At Everett, 256. Parker, 229. Uh, Bailey at 305. Stone, 554. And the high school at 706 for an enrollment of 23.56. You know that's down by six. If you remember, we were bringing back our online uh, failures and we worried about possibly losing some of those. So far today, uh, I think we've lost 10 in, uh, to homeschool because they wanted to go stay online. Uh, however, we, we got some students back, so that's why our number just dropped by six. We got four students uh, back. Our ADA enrollment uh, is similar to that. The uh, Higgins is 288, Everett 256, Parker 206, Bailey 305, Stone 554, High School 706. For our ADA of 2315, and that's the students that we can count here. And again, that's down by six. So the ADA average through December 9th was 2186.31, which is still 94.69% attendance. Uh, again, you know, the whole harmless is good through December. I know Ms. Stewart has said that some of the organizations are sending letters to the congressman asking for an extension of the whole harmless because there are some school districts that are going to be hit very hard, like in the millions of dollars. And so uh, we, we, we're hoping that they extend it, but who knows. Uh, and so if you look down there, you know, our whole harmless, uh, at our attendance right now, if we didn't have the whole harmless, it would be 47.4 uh, less students than what we budgeted for. And so when we start talking about those numbers, it's 47 times 6160. So uh, we're hoping that the whole harmless continues. Uh, is there any questions on attendance? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, I see discussion only in my Z grant, Ms. Ingram. Good evening. I'm Jody Ingram. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the instructional technology specialist for the district, if you don't know. Um, and tonight I'm here to talk about an issue that we've had and an opportunity that we've come across also. At North Lamar, we have a history of achieving above state average on the state STAR math test. But unfortunately, we have been behind the state on student growth on math, and it's been a trend. So this affects our accountability, but it also affects us reaching individual students. We can see the fact that through this, that our kids are not growing at a rate that they are at the state. And so um, we need to be targeting each individual student and how they need to grow. And you can't do that in the traditional method of standing in the front of the room and teach to your students. You're just, you're not reaching them individually. But you can if you use blended learning. And so uh, in September, a leadership team, including Assistant Superintendent Angela Chadwick, math, uh, math coach Ellen McLaughlin and myself, wrote and submitted the Math Innovation Zone grant to TEA. In October, we found out we had been selected as one of the schools in a very competitive group. So, uh, Math Innovation Zone. 
is a four-year process to design, launch, scale, and sustain a high-quality blended learning model in math through a K-8 theater pattern. The blended learning model is more than just adding technology to our curriculum. Blended learning is an instructional methodology that leverages technology to provide a personalized approach to learning, giving students control over their time, their place, their path, and their pace of their learning. This grant will provide necessary resources and professional development so that our teachers can effectively integrate uh, blended learning into their lesson design and create a student-directed classroom. That was the definition of the grant from the website from GEA. Uh, during the four years of the grant, North Lamar will receive $425,000. So, um, but we have to meet the criteria with Fidelity. We have decided based on our campus grade spans, we will be starting next year with grades four, five, and six. The second year, we will add second, third, and seventh. And then the final year of the grant, will bring in kinder, first, and eighth. So that means that once a kid starts in the blended learning method, they'll never leave it. They'll continue on and we'll keep growing it. So in the 23-24 school year, 100% of our K-8 students will be getting personalized learning in math every day. Um, like most, most grants, this one comes with requirements. One requirement is that throughout the four years, the district project manager devotes 50% of their time to group grant. I will be your project manager and steps are being taken or ready to relieve me of my other, so my, some of my other duties so that I will have time for the grant. Um, another requirement is that we have to do data uploads to TEA to document that we are doing their curriculum with fidelity. And we'll have monthly meetings with the teachers to uh, evaluate how the grant's going and how our student progress is going. For the grant, this is considered year zero we will receive $125,000 for this year. This year we are to design and plan what we will do with North Lamar. And so this is for us to bring in a consultant to make a plan that is unique to North Lamar. Instead of just taking a cookie cutter, what works for Dallas, what works for somewhere else, we will actually be bringing in a consultant to design our plan. Um, the rest of the money for this year will can be spent on, a, or must be spent on a design and implementation consultant, blended learning professional development, and teacher supplies. This first year, we cannot spend any money on student supplies or software. The sec, or years three, or one through three, will also include my salary, 50% of my salary, assessment software, assess, uh, curriculum software, and then I can get student devices and soft, uh, resources. Uh, the leadership team has already selected our design and implemented implementation consultant. We will be using Engage to Learn as our partners to create a blended learning model for the district. Our goal is to implement a model that it creates a culture where students develop ownership of their education through goal setting, learning choices, and pace. We are excited to begin this. The idea of every student getting a personalized education for math moved my heart and so we are looking forward to working with our, forward with our team and our teachers as we do this initiative. Any questions? Is this new or have other schools already tried this? This will be the fourth year of the grant uh, of the cohorts and so they um, there are 17 in our group and so there's been like about that number every year for the past four years so 17 what? There are 17 school districts that were chosen the, oh, okay. this year for us. Okay. Now, so, some of them that, like you said, they've had this for four years. Uh, some of the ones that have had it for four years, are they finding this successful? Yes. The, uh, the growth rates on uh, student achievement have increased in all the school districts. I what, are some, what are some school districts that are using this? The ones that are closest to us that we might recognize, uh, Atlanta, Mineola, a little bit further away, uh, Cisco. We were trying to look at some that were comparable in our demographics kind of situation, so that's really why I picked those to talk about. Um, but yeah, I can get you connected to other schools, uh, superintendents. Uh, the Cisco superintendent cannot say enough great things about this and how it has changed his culture and his scores and 
they have actually spread it beyond math. Matter of fact, most of these schools who have done it with math have also rewritten the grant within a couple of years to include another content area. So, any other who questions? Might, who makes up your team? My team, the leadership team is Ella McLaughlin and Angela Chadwick. Uh, the principals on the designated campuses that we're starting, you know, we're bringing in the principals whenever it's their campus and uh, the teachers from those campuses. So um, we'll be choosing the different software packages next. Um, and the great thing is the grant was rewritten this year to allow us to actually pilot a little bit in April and May. And so in the four, the school districts that have gone blind into August and just hope that they've chosen the right software package. And so they've rewritten it and they're gonna let us pilot beforehand. So we're excited about that. Are the teachers excited about changing to this? There's, I'm not gonna lie, there's some apprehension, but most of them are excited about the possibility of seeing the growth. I mean, they know that it's gonna be hard work. There's no way around that. But um, they're excited about the personalized learning and the growth potential. Any other things? Thank you. Thank you. And moving on to D, discussion only, grant funding by Dr. Chadwick. Also, reminded me while Jody was talking, DEA is so invested in this grant that they are allowing you to be off of the accountability rating in, what, in the content area that you're running this grant in during the grant. So what they're saying is we believe enough in this to not only fund it at almost half a million dollars per district, but to take accountability off your plate while you're trying something new. Because a lot of times teachers and principals, they don't want to try something new when they're going into a rating that's going to affect, you know, their school grade, could be on the front page of the newspaper, whatever. So TEA believes in blended learning that much. It's really been a, something that they've been pushing for several years now. And one of the things that I wanted to talk to you about the grant funding is this funding is not local taxpayer dollars. So it's specific to the grant. And the first thing that we have to do is pay for the consultant, which is supposed to be about half the cost of the grant this year. So we know that sometimes we're going to be requesting purchase orders that are over the $25,000 max for superintendent approval. But since it's not local taxpayer dollars, this is going to come from a 429 account. And it does not have to go through board approval because it's already predetermined from TEA what we have to spend the money on. So does that make sense to you? That's what I wanted to explain about the funding piece. It's not our local taxpayer dollars. Okay, that's it. Any questions about that? Anything that'll help in math sounds like a positive. <laughs> now, now, now we'll go to writing, huh? That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. That sounds good. Thank you. Thank you. I'm next, so I'm just oh, you are right. Consideration and approval of the 2021 district improvement plan, Dr. Chadwick. Okay, so we have our annual district improvement plan. You got city campus improvement plans last month. Um, so I'm going to give you just a very brief about each goal. I know you've got the plan in front of you, so I'm not actually going to follow it page by page. I'm just going to give some brief information. Um, goal one, provide students a quality education that will demonstrate academic success and individual growth. This is how the committee that put the district improvement plan together says they're going to address that. Through interventions, instructional support, communication across campuses, pay the cost of two AP exams to increase participation in accelerated learning courses, provide SPED, ALC, DAP, dyslexia, ESL, GT, extracurricular activities and intervention classes, and provide credit recovery, counseling services, make calls to parents when students are absent, and focus on more advanced academic opportunities. So that's performance, or that's goal one. Goal two is to provide teachers with the curriculum, technology, instructional programs, and training necessary for student growth. The way we'll address that is training in instructional technology, 
to build technological capacity and infrastructure, professional development opportunities, purchase materials for professional development activities. And that in itself is a description of the MIS grant that we applied for. Um, also pay $500 above state base for a master's degree for teachers, review certification, service records, and paratraining training requirements. Also, if you'll recall, we have the mental program allotment grant that we applied for and received. So all teachers that are mentoring a beginning teacher, which is extremely important professional development, are receiving an additional $1,000 from grant funds that they did not receive last year to do this additional work. So for a total of $1,200 that is not being funded through taxpayer dollar, local taxpayer dollars here this year as well. Goal three, provide a quality learning environment that is positive, safe, and supportive. We're doing that through programs that prevent the illegal use of drugs. Alcohol and tobacco will be implemented at all levels. Internet safety training and campuses will maintain a strong discipline, code of conduct, and plan for action of, for emergencies. They will, campuses will conduct safety drills and training. Safety issues will be monitored and corrected. School nurses will provide health care services to the student body. Also, we will inform parents and community through open print, online news providers, and social media. We'll encourage parent participation. A parent family engagement plan is developed with parents in the room and on the committee. And the final goal, goal four, to develop a plan that helps with college and career readiness by facilitating a process that explores self-interest and career aspirations. We'll do that through preparation for higher education readiness tests. SAT, ACT, and TSIA will be provided through course contents and CTE courses. We'll increase career tech offerings that offer certifications. We've also invested in some dual credit textbooks so students do not have to come out of their pocket for those. They are classroom sets in the, in the uh, dual credit, some of the dual credit classrooms. We're going to add to that as we go each year. And we're also bringing in a specialist to run an SAT, ACT boot camp to support the students scoring high on those exams. And finally, um, elementary students learn about community through field trips, career speakers, and other activities, although we've canceled all the virtual field trips this year due to COVID. And career investigations class in eighth grade, the use of career cruising, and guest speakers participation in career fairs, which again, a couple of those things will be probably delayed until next year. Anyway, do you have any questions for our district improvement planning? There's none, then I'll leave you on that one until we hit it again next year. Thank you. Okay. Okay, so we do need um, a motion for approval for the district improvement and plan. Do I have a motion? Motion made by Bo. Do I have a second? Seconded by Red. So, uh, any discussion? All in favor? All opposed? No, motion carries 5 to 0. We'll move on to item F, consideration and approval educator, educator appraisal waiver by Ms. Stewart. Okay, in front of you, you have a copy of the educator appraisal waiver resolution. Um, this was not in your board book. This is something that I laid at your, on your desk tonight. On December 10th, the Texas Education Agency uh, met with the superintendents in the state of Texas and issued instructions for submitting an educator appraisal waiver. Our administrative team sat down and we went through all of the guidance. If you will look down towards the bottom, I'm going to read a couple of bullets so that everybody in the audience can um, hear what's on this resolution. Uh, North Lamar Independent School District shall seek waivers for all general teacher appraisal requirements under scenario E of the educator appraisal submission instructions as identified in paragraph 8E of TEA's instructions dated December 10th, 2020. The waiver of the appraisal shall not apply to any certified employee of North Lamar Independent School District who is currently employed on a probationary contract as that term is defined in TEC Code Chapter 21. The waiver of appraisal shall not apply to any other certified employee of North Lamar Independent School District whom the district at its discretion determines would benefit from an appraisal. So what this means is we have to ask permission from the school board to be able to apply for this waiver our probationary teachers will continue uh, to be evaluated this school year and then we are leaving it up to the discretion of the principals if they have a non-probationary teacher on their campus whom they feel needs to be evaluated. I move that we accept this resolution. 
Okay, motion made by Sheila, seconded by Bo. Any discussion? All in favor? All opposed? Motion carries five to zero. Um, move on to item number seven, superintendent's report. Okay, in front of you tonight, there's a copy of the superintendent evaluation. This is the same evaluation form that we used last year. I've attached an envelope to it that is postmarked to be mailed to the school board president's home. I ask that you please fill that out and put that in the mail by December 31st because once Ms. Preston receives those evaluations, then she needs to compile the data and then uh, we will schedule a conference so that she can go over the evaluations with me. Um, our board training has been scheduled for Wednesday, January 13th at 5.30 p.m. here at the administration building. Just a reminder that all eight of us have to be present for this training, so please mark that date on your calendar. Does anyone have any questions? What was the date? January 13th at 5.30. And so now at this time, which is 628, we'll move to item number eight, public hearing on the application for appraised value limitation on qualified property from Mockingbird Solar Center, LLC, comptroller application number 1513, pursuant to tax, Texas Tax Code 313. This is just the opportunity for public members to ask questions related to the application that is before the, uh, the district tonight for consideration. I, I don't have any formal presentation related to that unless there are questions to which I can provide information. We also have representatives from Lockheed Solar that can answer project with related questions too. Does anybody have any questions, public or board members? Okay. So at this time, we'll close the public hearing out at 629 and move on to the next agenda item, which is item number nine. Acknowledgement by each individual trustee of the Northmar ISD Board of Trustees conflict of interest policy in connection with the application and agreement for limitation on appraised value of property for school district maintenance and operations taxes by and between Northmar ISD and Mockingbird Solar Center LLC, Comptroller Application Number 1513. And I'll turn it over to Young, Ms. Powell, Youngblood, and Taylor. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. Uh, board members, as we've done in the past with regard to this project, this is not an action item. This is just simply for your, uh, uh, for, for the district's records to indicate that you've gone through the consideration of your, your uh, normal conflict uh, analysis that you do with regard to any transaction under BBFA. Um, and so that is attached, and so the, the, the two possible scenarios in which uh, a board member might have a conflict would be if you or, or a first degree relative has an interest in land that is within the project, or if you or your first degree relatives uh, have an ownership interest in Mockingbird Solar. So if neither of those are the case, then uh, you would uh, declare and, and I'd like for you to do that as well, board members, uh, for purposes of the meeting, but also initial on the form. And if you'll pass one of those forms around and get everybody's initials on each one, indicate a check for any uh, for the board members that are not present tonight. Um, but again, either initial no conflict or initial disclosure and disclose your disclosure. Any questions about that? Ms. Trammell, what was your, uh, uh, what was your deck? Uh, no conflict. No conflict, okay. No conflict. Okay. No conflict. No conflict. No conflict. We, we do this just to make the process clearer in case there's ever an audit with regard to the project. Uh, 
um, with those declarations being made, we're going to move to the to the other two items with regard to the solar farm, and I'm going to give a little bit of explanation for for uh, for the process. So the the first item is consideration of the uh, findings of fact. That is the big uh, uh, kind of package that's in front of you that's called findings. Um, this is the documentary due diligence that you as a board uh, would, would base your decision on with regard to approving uh, the application and approving the proposed agreement. So this will be the, the support for it, all right? So the first part of it <clears throat> is the actual findings. The Exhibit A is the Comptroller's Economic Impact Analysis. Uh, basically, that report uh, shows that the, economic, that the uh, uh, project is economically viable for the state, of the state of Texas. Exhibit B, uh, on, on, on your behalf, we as your council engaged um, uh, Region 12 for purposes of, and with your approval, for purposes of doing a uh, financial analysis to determine whether or not the project is in the best interest of the school district. That Exhibit B is that report, okay? And so uh, I'm going to point your attention to the last page of Exhibit B that is the, that, that is the summary of the financial impact. And it's a chart that I'm, I'm pointing to you right here in case you don't see it on the last page. But that right there will tell you the, uh, the uh, in summary, the financial impact on the district. Uh, then the last exhibit is Exhibit C. And that is the proposed agreement. If you approve the application after approving the findings, then the last that then also will be for consideration on that item is the approval of the agreement itself. Okay, and we have on on the, uh, the district's behalf uh, negotiated the proposal for you in front of you um, the terms of the agreement. Now. I'm going to turn it over to just Shelley Lung in just a minute to talk about the findings themselves. But let me just cover a couple of broad strokes. So uh, first of all, uh, this is based upon projections. Uh, our projections and Region 12's projections, along with the applicants, we, we have faith that they're good projections and that they will come, come to fruition. But will actually uh, determine the numbers every year based upon the uh, the uh, simple appraisal district's determination of value and those calculations will be made official each year but we expect that the projections in that exhibit b summary page to, to be accurate um, also uh, while again the applicant has indicated that they will build the project until they build the project, and they have until, I, I think, the uh, start of 2023, January 1, to build the project, um, uh, it, it won't be uh, definitive until that point that the district re receives the revenue uh, in, the, in the projections. So the, the district will not start receiving a benefit, and again, that's in the summary chart, until the, uh, 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 the revenue protection benefit in year, tax year 2023, and then the supplemental payments start in year 2024, and they will be payable for the years in which the applicant receives the net tax benefit. This project is right on, on the uh, kind of little, little on the fence in terms of the benefit to the company. So as a result, uh, when when projects are, are like this one, um, uh, rather than the maximum supplemental payment, which would be $100, time, uh, $100 times ADA, in order for it to be in the interest of both the district and the company, we've negotiated a, a uh, 
uh, a, a share in the company's net tax benefit, and that will be payable again in the years in which the company receives the net tax benefit. Shelley's going to go over the specific details on that, but I just want to make sure that I explain kind of when the benefits start for the, for the district. And at, at this point, I'll turn it over to Shelley to go over in detail the findings of Good evening, Board of Trustees. Good evening, Ms. Stewart. Thanks for having us here this evening. Uh, as Rick said, I will be going over this 70-some page manuscript with you, but I'll just go over the highlights. Um, so, Board finding number one starts on page three of the packet. The applicant, Mockingbird Solar Center LLC, is proposing to build a solar farm under the eligibility category of Renewable Energy Electric Generation. The qualified investment is $120 million. In board findings three through five, those are also on page three. Uh, the applicant commits to creating one new job with an annual salary of $45,958. The applicant has requested a waiver of the job creation requirement, and the board finds that the waiver should be granted because the number of jobs is consistent with solar industry standards. And so it is standard that a solar energy company would request for that waiver. Uh, board findings six through nine are on pages four through six of your packet, and these are based on the comptroller's economic impact analysis study, which is attached as exhibit A. Uh, based on the comptroller's 25-year projection, the project is likely to generate tax revenue to sufficiently offset the m and loss as a result of the agreement. So in other words, the comptroller has determined that the project is economically viable for the state of Texas. In conjunction, we asked school finance consultants to prepare a school finance report on behalf of the school district. And that, again, is attached as exhibit, exhibit B that Rick had referred to. And table three, which is the very last page of that exhibit, is the, is the summary of the estimated financial impact on the district. And so I'm going to go over the specific numbers with you that are projected in that report. The revenue protection benefit to the district is $661,018. And uh, as Rick had mentioned, that would be in the first year in which the company is able to see a benefit. So that's uh, tax year 20, uh, 2023. The supplemental payment benefit, uh, and this is over the course of the agreement, so over the next 15 or so years, uh, that summation is projected to be $874,399. And that is roughly 50% of the company's gross tax savings. The M&O revenue to the district over the term of the agreement uh, with the current, projected with the current tax rate of 0.9664, that is $3,942,912. And so the total revenue to the district, so that would be the revenue protection benefit, the supplemental payment benefit, and the M&O revenue. That totals to be $5,478,329. The company's net tax benefit is $1,537,736. Then board findings 10 through 11, uh, that is on page 6 of your packet. The comptroller has determined that without the Chapter 313 property tax incentive, the project will not fill within the school district. Board findings 12 through 14 are on pages 6 through 7 of the packet. The applicant has requested a limitation amount of $30 million, and this value is consistent with the comptroller's minimum values. Uh, your counsel, Powell, Youngblood, and Taylor, uh, along with the school district's finance consultants at Region 12, and with Ms. Kelly Stewart, uh, we have all done the due diligence in reviewing and verifying the information in the application, and we have determined that that information provided is correct. 
Four findings 15 through, six, uh, 15 through 16 are on page 7 of your packet. Based on the information that's contained in the board findings of fact, which include the Comptroller's Economic Impact Analysis Study and includes uh, the school finance report, we find that it is in the financial interest of the district to enter into the proposed form of agreement, which is attached as Exhibit C. And so if you turn to Exhibit C, I'll go over to some of the key pieces of information in the agreement itself. Uh, firstly, please note that the majority of this agreement is a proposed or a prescribed mandatory template by the comptroller, and so we're only allowed to change certain parts of the agreement itself. And those parts that we're allowed to change are the timeline of the agreement, which is in Article 2, the revenue protection provisions, which are in Article 4, and the supplemental payments, which are in Article 6. So if you turn to um, Article 2 on page 8 specifically, that goes over the timeline. The qualifying time period starts on January 1 of 2021, so that's immediately following this tax year. And this is the time in which the applicant must make its qualified or minimum qualified investment of $30 million. And that qualified investment must be made by January 1 of 20, uh, 2023. The tax limitation period starts on January 1 of 2023 and it ends on December 31 of 2032 and so that's a 10-year limitation period. The final termination date of the agreement is December 31 of 2037 and so that is five years after the limitation period has ended. If you flip to pages 15 through 16, this discusses the supplemental payments um, and it just outlines what we discuss um, with the 50% of the gross tax savings that the applicant is willing to share as opposed to the $100 per ADA. Um, and then consequences of early termination or breach of the agreement by the applicant would result in payment of all back taxes owed to the district as and that's outlined in Article 9. And then we also have Mr. Jordan Schantz here as a representative with Mockingbird Solar Center LLC and he has he's able to answer any questions you have related to the project itself. And then we can also answer any questions you have regarding the financial projections or any other questions you may have. Thank you. So I do have a quick question and you may have gone over this. Um, on the exhibit B on that last summary sheet where it has the school district revenue losses um, $661,800. I know you touched on that. So what does that actually mean to the to the district? Because I mean, if you look at it, it looks like a loss, but yes, so can you explain a, that? That is a great question. So this, um, what what is called, it's called a loss because of how the agreement is written, but in actuality, it is a theoretical loss. Okay. It is actually a benefit to the district because without the agreement in place, there would be no project. And so that revenue wouldn't be realized unless there was an agreement in place. And so this is where your school finance consultants run two separate projections. They look at your m and revenue with the agreement versus without the agreement. And then if there is a net difference, uh, and th that the applicant would make up for that difference. And so that provision for that protection, what we call is the revenue loss protection payment, that's in Article 4 of the agreement. But every year, the school finance consultants will go through those side-by-side -side calculations to determine if there's any loss to the district. And if, or it's a theoretical loss. Okay. But, uh, Basically, the, <coughs> the benefit is that in looking at the, uh, at, at the M and O revenue with and without the agreement, obviously with the agreement, there is a, a, a with the agreement and the, the additional uh, property uh, improvements, there's a difference in that first year of the limitation period because of that change between 
the one year and then the next year when the improvements go under limitation. So as a result, there's this theoretical six hundred and some odd thousand dollars. They pay that to the district. So it's actually a, a, a payment to the district, not not a not a lot. Okay. okay. Thank you. Appreciate yes, it. And that payment is not subject to recapture. Right. Along with the supplemental payments. Those are also not subject to recapture. And okay. it's typically just the one time in the first year of the limitation period. All right, thank you. So we'll need a motion to consider possible action. Motion made by Red, seconded by Bo. Any discussion? All those in favor? All opposed? Okay, motion carries 5-0. Okay, so we'll go on to item 10, consider and possible action to approve the application for appraised value limitation on qualified property and enter into an agreement for limitation on appraised value of property for school district maintenance and operations taxes by and between North Lamar ISD and Mockingbird Solar Center LLC, Comptroller Application 1513, pursuant to Texas Tax Code 313. Based upon your approval of the findings in the last action item, as your district counsel, we recommend that the board approve the application and adopt the proposed agreement. And we don't have any further presentation on that unless there's further questions. Let me ask a question. If there were negatives to this, what would the negatives be? Well, the negatives could be that the project costs the district revenue as opposed to making the district revenue, or if the applicant was not performing or offering the benefits that are allowed by statute. But based upon the findings that you just adopted, they have assured that there are no negatives. So again, this process does not cost the district in terms of consideration. The proposed form of agreement, the findings of fact, and the school finance report along with the comptroller's economic analysis all show that it's viable for the state of Texas that the district is receiving a benefit. We negotiated the best form of agreement that we could. And again, as shown at the end of Exhibit B, because the financial benefit to the company is less than what you could receive as a maximum supplemental payment, we negotiated a split of the net tax benefit to the applicant. So looking at the total amount that the applicant would save from taxes based upon a reduction or a limitation of value for the property during the 10-year limitation period, we looked at that gross tax savings and negotiated a split of that. That is fairly standard under these type of economic terms. So we believe that it's in the benefit of the district to do that. But the bottom line is there are no negatives that could occur based upon the negotiation and the terms that have been submitted to you in the findings of fact. So while there could be negatives based upon the findings, and again, they are projections, but there is no negative to the district. What about the taxpayer? The taxpayer? Yeah. 
I mean, so, how are our taxpayers? I mean, is this yeah, are there going to be? This, how does this impact your your other taxpayers? That's a good question. So, so uh, again, the the only uh, taxpayers that are paying pursuant to this agreement is the applicant based upon the improvements to the land that's within the project. This does not impact um, uh, uh, the uh, other taxpayers that, are, that don't have land within the project, okay? Um, but, but the other thing is uh, if the district considers a bond, for example, there is no, uh, uh, there's no limitation on the INS side. So essentially, uh, uh, you're, you're, as a district, you do not need to raise as much revenue to meet your facilities needs, for example, because a lot of that it would end up being paid for by the, by the increased uh, taxes on the improvements within that project. And in other words, because of that, you don't have to raise as many pennies in order to meet your needs. So that's a plus to your other taxpayers, for example. Does that answer, yes, sir. That answer your question? Thank you. Okay. Good questions. Okay, so we already have a motion made by Bo, so I need a second by Red. And all those in favor? All those opposed? Okay, motion carries five to zero. And at this time, we will now go into executive session. So we'll conduct a closed meeting in accordance with the Texas Open Meetings Act, Texas Government Code, Chapter 551, Subchapters D and E. And that is 653.